and walk home. Yeah, which way? Huh? Which Hello, way Slush Tokyo. <laughs> are we going to stand or are we going to yeah, sit? Uh, I guess sit. we're sitting. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, everybody. So um, I wanted to start by actually uh, introducing a little bit more deeply uh, Maya Rogers. She is an absolutely amazing entrepreneur and leader. Um, she actually grew up here in Yokohama for most of her life, moved to Hawaii when you were 11. Yeah. And, um, and she freaking runs Tetris. Like, I mean, I, who hasn't heard of Tetris? Um, Anybody? So. No, I'm <laughs> Tell me, like, so, I mean, I played Tetris when I was a little kid. Yeah. I obviously, I, I mean, I, I was very competitive at this thing, but how, you know, I, I'm so surprised that even today, Tetris is still really big and growing and... Yeah, that's probably the number one question I get is like, oh my gosh, like, I played this when I was a kid, or more recently, it's like, oh, that used to be my mom's favorite game, you know, mm. and you're like, oh my gosh, yes, of course. Um, so Tetris has been around for 32 years now. Um, but amazingly, it's been, um, it, you know, it's still one of the most well-known uh, brands in the world. And we have a full-time licensing gig. So we work with, you know, like a 20 different electronic licensees um, and 30 different, like, merchandising licensees. So at any time, we're dealing with multiple, multiple um, different companies that help produce, develop um, our game, and then distribute it around the world. So in Japan, for example, um, we're working with Dentu, who is our merchandising agent. Um, and then uh, we just launched Tetris Puyo Puyo on Nintendo Switch. It was a launch title, just to give you an example. So it's everywhere still. Oh, wow. So yeah. what's, the, what's your number one platform for Tetris number today? Number one platform by far is the, uh, the mobile phone. Uh, we were the first product, uh, first branded product in the, in, outside of Japan on the mobile phones. And so that really was where S Tetris most saw the most success. Contrary to popular belief, you know, most people think that Game Boy was the, the game that really brought us all of the, our revenues, but it was really the mobile phones, right? And so now we have over 500 million paid downloads, which doesn't count all the freemium games that we have now. Wow. So now, when's the last time you launched a mobile phone game with uh, well, so, so we have two products on the market now that's been around for about three years, yeah. Yeah, but... Tell me about your gaming background and like. Oh, it's uh. It we met last. We met last night and we <laughs> got to know each other. So I know a lot about Lyle. Yeah. So for me, um, I've been around games. I mean, I'm mostly I've been a gamer. Yeah. And so I was very competitive with my brother growing up. We played Tetris. We played uh, Quake. Uh, mm -hmm. Quake was this game. I don't know. Most of you probably don't know this, but uh, Quake was this game that is like this first-person shooter. And my brother and I actually got really competitive. And then we actually turned professional playing this game for money. We were sponsored by companies like Microsoft and Intel. My brother was much better than me, unfortunately. Uh, and he won a Ferrari in one of these tournaments. That's and so crazy. this like, you know, he was like 16 years old, wins a car. And, um, and so that's kind of how we got kind of started in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, I, I hadn't made games, but we started a, our, our first company was Gamers.com. It was a media site around games. And mm -hmm. so we were trying to write um, strategy guides, build communities around gamers, raised a crap ton of money back in the dot-com era, lost all the money, realized how terrible we were at running companies. But so you were like literally too early to the market now, right? Because look at everything that's happening today. I mean, with Twitch and YouTube. Oh, yeah. and I mean, you were kind of like at the forefront of that. Uh, we really loved the idea of esports yeah. back then. And so we started actually this thing called the PGL, uh, which was the uh, Professional Gamers League. And so we did believe in the concept of esports and that everyone's going to compete. And more people play video games than have pl grown up playing sports. So it would be a natural thing. But we were kind of early for that. Too early. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So it's interesting because we're both kind of started like we grew up around games. And then, you know, you had a whole bunch of startups, right? I mean, like your last company, Lithium, you raised, what, $140 million? Yeah. Um, so Lithium was this company that's an enterprise software. So yeah. we sold community software for large companies. And we spun it off because um, we had built community software for gamers.com. And it was like stuff for gamers to talk to each other and share tips and strategies. And then we thought, oh, maybe that'd be interesting to take that into uh, enterprises, and, and sure enough, like uh, Sony PlayStation was yeah. one of our first customers. I used to work there many, many years ago. Yeah, so I mean, they were awesome back then. And, um, and so yeah, for most of my career, about almost over 10 years, I was building this company 
selling software for about, I mean, the average price, I mean, this is big enterprise software, so like quarter million dollars a year, half a million dollars a year. Um, and uh, that thing grew really big. We raised a lot of money. We ultimately grew to about 500 people. I, let a, I hired a CEO to take over. And then I was like, well, you know, I love games. I've played yeah. games all my life. I wanted to start, um, to, I wanted to see if I could make a game. Um, so I have this uh, co-founder who was my friend from college, and he, uh, he founded Rotten Tomatoes. And so he and I were kind of like drunk one night, and we're trying to figure out, well, what do we want to do now if it's just for fun, um, something that we've never done before? Mm -hmm. And we thought, oh, cool. How awesome would it be to make mobile games? Well, and so how long have you, have you guys been doing that, the mobile gaming company? I've been doing that for two years. Two years. And I've got to say, like, I would never recommend anybody start <laughs> a mobile gaming company. Huh? It's probably, like, I mean, by far and away, the, one of the hardest things to do. I agree. I mean, it's tough competition out there, right? So I think for Tetris, we, we were the first IP to be out on the market. And mm. so we were number one for many, many years. But today, there's so much competition. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, how much money you have to spend to advertise your game just to get people to play uh, yeah. it? Yeah, and it's, uh, the, the economics just don't work. I mean, actually, you know, the number one thing that I found about gaming and why it's so hard is, yeah, there's a lot of other things, like the cost of getting yeah. users and all this. but. The problem is when you start a mobile gaming company and you're like trying to make a game, you are competing literally with some of the most passionate people. These are not like folks who are hiding away doing a nine to five job at a large company. The people who make games do it because they love it and right. they're passionate about it. And so that's like a really hard thing to do because you can't rely on the fact that, well, we'll just work harder, faster. We are our startup. I mean, basically all the competition are also startups and yeah. they're all wor working really, really hard. I mean, I think that also speaks true to the startup world, right? I mean, like, so, so I run an accelerator that we've been around for four years, and you're now mentoring at Y Combinator. And so, you know, I mean, we, we see, like, every startup that comes through, I mean, every idea that you have, just remember that everybody else is doing the same thing faster and better than you, so it's yeah. up to you to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I'll, that, I, mean I guess we can talk a little bit about our, sub, our work at Accelerator. Yeah. So, um, as Maya mentioned, for the last six months, I've been working at Y Combinator, helping advise companies and uh, you know helping them kind of raise money. Now we just did Demo Day last week, which was uh, which was great. You How know. big was your batch? Uh, our last batch was over 110 companies. Yeah. All across, I mean, some of the most like you know consumer B two B B two C. We had nonprofits. I mean, it was all over the place. Um, but yeah, it was so fun to work with we them. Have, we have a batch of 10 companies <laughs> twice a year. Okay, so it's not quite that scale, but no, no. Still, but I mean, you're in Hawaii, yeah, yeah. so I think you have an unfair advantage there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting. Um, so yeah, we've been around for four years. Uh, we've invested in over 60 companies to date, um, and they've gone and raised $66 million in follow-on funding, wow. which is huge for Hawaii, right? So mm. one of the... One of the myths about Hawaii is that people think it's a place where people come to like hang out and hang out on the beach and just vacation, but it's actually, we have a real city, you know, we have a million yeah. people living on Oahu and shit happens there. Um, we have this thing called Startup Paradise. So right now there's five active accelerators that are, um, you know, that have different um, places where they're focused and so we're one of them. And so we have this whole ecosystem and, you know, the fact that we were ranked, you know, top 20 accelerator by TechCrunch, that really has put us on the map and so we get applicants from around the world and we were kind of talking about like, you know, the types of applicants, like what are the, some of the myths that Y Combinator has, for example? You want to talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of times people think about um, accelerators. They think, oh, well, we don't really fit because we're not a super early stage company or we've raised money before. But I think that's like one of the most common things that people don't realize is that um, companies like Y Combinator and Blue Startups, yeah. I mean, we, we accept applications from companies across many different stages. Yep. Some of the companies literally have no idea, no revenue. Yeah. Some companies well, you should have, have some idea. Yeah. I mean, but it's funny. Like, <laughs> but, yeah. they literally, no, no, sometimes yeah. it's just the most amazing founders and, yeah. you know, they apply uh, with some initial idea, but it's not really flushed out. Yeah. Sometimes, they're, you know, companies are doing, you know, well. series A level kind yeah. of revenues, a million dollars a year or two million dollars a year, and, and, and yet they still apply. So, I think that's one thing that we yeah. learned. It's like, most of the time when I go out there and meet companies and I, and I find startups in, around the world, I'm like, how come you guys didn't apply to YC? Yeah. 
it's oftentimes because they thought that it didn't fit them, but in actuality, they should have. Yeah. I mean, so I think that is one of the things, right? Like, if you think that you're not qualified, then uh, like it's a self-selection in some ways you know too. I mean? I like guess. you have to, you have to really want yeah. it, right? And so the other thing we talked about was like, you know, what are the com some of the common traits that we see in entrepreneurs? And like, right away, um, it's hard to find out during the interview stage because you know you're not really facing, you know, spending enough time with them. And but the moment they come into our program, like right away, you know, some of the guys who are going to be successful mm -hmm. versus some who aren't. And what is that common thing, you know? And we talked about like. For me, it's, it's heart. Like they, they, they really believe in it, and you can tell that they're going to just do whatever they can to be successful. Yeah. And like they could have a really crappy idea, but they learn through that process, and then like they learn how to pivot the company, for example, yeah. and do something completely different. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought I knew when I walked into YC how to pick a company. I mean, I've seen enough co people who've succeeded. I've yeah. seen enough companies that have failed. I figured I kind of knew. And basically, YC taught me that I was completely wrong. Yeah. Um, what we found was that the, when at the initial application interview process, people that you know I used to think would be like, oh my gosh, these folks are so amazing. I love their idea, blah, blah, blah. Actually, some of the best ones didn't turn out to be that great. And then the ones that we thought, oh, this is kind of a weird thing they're doing, and it's kind of you know, funny, you know, eccentric mm -hmm. folks, and, and yet sometimes they're the ones that break out. And, and I think you know, Maya and I were talking a little bit earlier and trying, to say, and trying to figure out what is that common thread. And I think for you, you know, saying it as hard, I think that really uh, resonates with me. Yeah. Um, on, on top of that, I would say it's, it's really easy for people on an interview for one time to kind of really show themselves well yeah. and to put everything they have into it. But it's really that grit and determination week after week to push yep. through and work really hard no matter what, kind of be able to kind of like, like basically stomach the down, the, the you know, things are not going to always work out great. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've had, we've had companies that, oh my gosh, they're, they're so great at the interview and they're a great team, great company, super yeah. smart. And then weeks go by and they're saying the same pitch. And it sounds great if you haven't heard it for, you yeah. know, like if this is your first time hearing it, they sound great. But they haven't really grown in that in that yeah, few so weeks or whatever. Yeah, so at YC we do this thing where every other week we have this thing called group office hours. Yeah. So this is when we get our group of all of our companies together, and they report back. They say, well, here's the things that we said. Here's the things that we said we're going to do in the last two weeks, like our goals, and here's what we did against those goals, and then here's what we think our goal should be coming up the next two weeks. Right. That's kind of generally the cadence. Yeah. 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 But. What I found was amazing is exactly right. I mean, when you do this every two weeks, you're checking in on these companies, asking them, did they hit their goals that they you know, said they're going to hit? Mm -hmm. And it's not us telling them that they should do this. Like, this is right. like their own you know, choice. People yeah. don't want to go every other week to this, you know, in front of their peers and say, oh, we missed our goals. Or, yeah. oh, yeah. well, we're doing the same thing we said we're doing last yeah. two weeks. And, and so it creates like that cadence actually really helps drive it, but that also weeds out the people that really just that are all talk. They can't actually execute. You can, it becomes really, really apparent. Yeah, I mean, so that's why the cohort system works is that you're really in that environment working with other, other people that are in the same boat as you, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it really pushes you. Because you asked me earlier, like, you know, do people really get work done in Hawaii? Like, do, or do they get like sidetracked because they want to go to the beach? And I was like, no, actually. <laughs> I mean, we have people that I literally have to go up to them and say, you need to go get in the sun for 10 minutes because you need a tan, you know? Like, you live in Hawaii for three months. Like, wow. you know, you got you to gotta be outside a little bit. Well, I think those guys have more discipline than I do. If I was <laughs> in Hawaii, I'd be, like, drinking Mai Tais and on the beach and yeah, surfing well. every day. I don't know if I'd ever get any work done. But that is so cool, though. I mean, I, who would ever have guessed that you can have, like, a top 20 accelerator base in Hawaii yeah. that is, you, you know, a, a mix of not only, like, really people that can help them, but just being able to live in paradise. You should come. You should come. I mean, that, that was one of the reasons why we started Accelerator Blue Startups in Hawaii is that, you know, it's our long-term vision. I'm fortunate enough to be able to have my career in Hawaii, and it's simply the best place to live. No offense, I love Tokyo. Like, I, this is my second home. Um, but, you know, to be able to create that where you can work anywhere, right? Because now we're all connected. Yeah, we have to get on the plane, and we have to have meetings with people. I mean, you know. So is there any downsides to living there? What are the downsides to living in Hawaii? I mean, you're on an island, so, you know, I mean, there's limited things. Like, th we have great food, but, you know, I've got 20 restaurants that I go to, and that's it. You know what I mean? Like, I come to Tokyo, and there's hundreds and hundreds of restaurants. How about in terms of the types of companies that you see 
being created in Hawaii? Yeah. Is there like a certain kind of like focus for them or is it all over? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty all over the place, but what we found in Hawaii is that our, our local companies, you know, they're, it, it's such a smaller pool of entrepreneurs that are available in Hawaii, but they are so dedicated, right? Because they're on, they, they're choosing lifestyle over career in a, mm. in a sense. And so if you're an entrepreneur living in Hawaii, you're going to do everything you can to make your company successful. So the companies that have that are our top performers have actually have been local companies, right? So if you're in the valley and you're, you know, let's say you, ha you have a team of like really great smart folks, ex Google, ex Apple guys. I mean, like if their startup doesn't work out, they're just going to go back and you know get another job. And so that that I think that is a difference for us in mm. in, in the in the entrepreneurs is that they're really dedicated because they have no choice but to succeed. Yeah, well, they want to be there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we talked about. Um, the no asshole rule. <laughs> <laughs> that is a common theme also, right? Is that like we do not want mm. people who are... Well, yeah, I mean, because I mean, I, th I had the same rule when I was running companies. Yeah. Um, and I was really happy to hear that YC had a similar rule, yeah. which is that, hey, if we're going to work with people every day and you're going to see them and, you know, after we accept someone, we basically work with them for the next three months. Right. Like, you want to work with nice people. Like yeah. you want to work with people that you would be willing to hang out with. You know, and so that was a really big deal. <laughs> totally. Um, so I would imagine in Hawaii, that's like a less of an issue, right? I mean, everyone's kind of happy and cheerful there. Yeah, pretty isn't? much. Yeah. 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 But uh, you get road rage because everybody's so nice, you know. And so, do you think that if a company was founded and started in Hawaii and they're getting traction? that they have to leave Hawaii in order to continue growing, raise more money? Um, so, you know, right now, you know, we find that the companies that, you know, maybe Series A, they still stay in Hawaii, but like by the time they reach Series B, they have to, you know, relocate to California or Seattle or wherever. What do you think will make uh, that change? Like, why is yeah. that, like, when would, just, could that stop? Yeah, I think right now, it's just there's not enough deal flow yet in Hawaii. So, you know, it's really a long, longer term vision. And if we can get a company that has you know, that has a big exit, that already is a success story for us. Because we know that uh, once you have Hawaii in your heart, people always come back, you know? And so, like, we have um, really, um, like, people like Pierre Omidyar who started eBay or um, Steve Case who started AOL. I mean, there are Hawaii locals that moved away and they bring their kids here, kids back to Hawaii to raise their kids. Mm. So, so, you know, we know that it's all going to come back around, you know? That's an interesting point. Like, I would actually imagine that a lot of successful business people, when they retire, they actually would want to retire to Hawaii. A lot of people do. And a lot of people And definitely, that actually yeah. creates, like, a mentor network yeah. that you theoretically can tap into it, investors, mentors, advisors. Yes. yes, for sure. Wow. Yeah, we have a lot of people, like, you know, hidden entrepreneurs or... Uh, early retired people that are living in Hawaii, for sure. Oh, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. All right, so... So wait, what's next for you okay. in your in your, your mobile games? Um, well, so as I mentioned, I was... Uh, we started this mobile gaming company. Yeah. Uh, was it called Hob Hobo Labs? Hobo Labs. It's, I realized how hard it is to do mobile gaming yeah. um, because you're, one, the competition that you're fighting against, yep. but two, it's, um, you know, nowadays, most of these games... Um, they, you know, it used to be that you sell a game, $50, whatever it is, that game hits and then it goes away. Right. But now, people have been making these games that basically stay on the charts for years. And so as they kind of dominate the charts and dominate the ad spend, it's really hard for small companies to go and yeah. push the games out there. But, you know, we're trying. And yeah. I mean, but, you know, I, I mean, you've, you've been so successful in your past startups, and now you're trying to, right, um, kind of launch your game. Right? Aren't you ready to launch your game this year sometime soon? Yeah, so our, we have a game. It's a um, Guild vs. Guild kind of multiplayer mobile game. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're launching it in probably two months. Awesome. So we'll see exactly, but uh, right now the plan is in two months. So that's why I'm out here and That uh, could be the next excited. Tetris. <laughs> I doubt it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for that. Yeah, cool. You know, one thing that we were talking about and we noticed, um, and I'm not sure why this is the case, but... Um, Going back to talking about accelerators, yeah. we noticed that in the, in the last batch at YC, we had companies that applied and got in from all over the world. I mean, we had companies from Morocco, Africa, Nigeria, China, Korea, but I couldn't, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I couldn't think of a single company that came through from Japan. 
and we uh, we actually yeah so we see the same thing is that we get applicants from all over the world and in Asia you know in mm. Korea and China and Singapore yeah. you know they're applying but we're just not getting hardly any Japanese applicants yeah I mean so to me that I find that really curious I mean yeah. obviously there is a startup ecosystem that's thriving yeah. in Japan how many how many of you are entrepreneurs in the audience or well, willing to admit we get two three four yeah, not wow. a lot of That's actually a lot less than I thought. Yeah. Where are all these other people were? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're maybe walking around. I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, so I guess regardless of whether maybe there's like a fewer number of entrepreneurs, and, and certainly that's culturally I can understand why that may be the case. But oddly, I mean, it seems like there's at least so much interest in, yeah. you know, folks participating in the startup ecosystem here. But I mean, I guess my ask would be, you know, I, I would love to see more applications coming from Japan. Uh, into programs like Y Combinator or Blue Startups. Blue startups. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. I think my, you know, my view is that, um, you know, Japan thinking is very right. We're an island nation, and that's how we were raised, right? And so that's kind of in the our culture. But you know, the reason why we were able to innovate after the after World War II and become, you know, like the top of of the world in their autom you know, like automobile or electronic or wherever that was. I mean, we have that ability and we were there and I feel like if we don't um, continue that, right, we're losing out to, to other countries that are more entrepreneurial. I mean, and I think Japan is very entrepreneurial. We just want to see more of that, like, come out to us. You know? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, hopefully we'll see more next batch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, actually, I want to go back to Tetris for a bit because that's such a fascinating topic for me. I mean, um, where do you think Tetris as a brand will be 10 years from today? Uh, you know, so for us, Tetris has really become a lifestyle brand. So it's not just it's not just the game, but it's something that you think about. You know, when you're cleaning a room or you're packing your dishwasher. Maybe not dishwasher here, but <laughs> you know, you're packing the trunk of a car. Yeah. You know, it's there's there's something about you wanting to put pieces together. You know, to organize is like an inherent human need. Mm. And so we want to take the brand beyond. You know, beyond gaming. And what's going to sustain us really is at the co at the core of it, it's it's the game. But you know, like we have a movie deal coming out. I mean, we have no way. <laughs> you know, uh, well, in 2018, uh, Tetris something I can't <laughs> say, but yeah. And so you know, we're doing, yeah. We 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 believe that Tetris is really um, you know an evergreen brand, and so hopefully 10 years from now, we can say uh, you know our grandkids are playing it or our kids. Wow. <laughs> we don't have kids yet. <laughs> is there actually Tetris like <laughs> Lego like blocks? Or is it all um, we we don't have Tetris Lego blocks yet, but we have stuff in the works. Yeah, but I think we got ten seconds. Oh, okay. So let's wrap this yeah. up. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank Maya. you, Lyle. So nice to meet you. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Well, Good luck with your game and. Well, and thank you all for uh, sticking through this as well. Awesome. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon.